Gmail.com. stars.com Yo, 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 what is up, B-Stars fam, how are we doing, we got a couple heads up in here already, as many of you know, I am Anjanette Lene, the live stream specialist here at BeatStars, and I am happy to bring you episode two of our mini-series, How to Get Paid on BeatStars. So, for today's episode, we have the... Attorney Kyle up in the house. You What's see, up? if I have my soundboard, I'll be doing the little womp, womp, womp right now. <laughs> yep. And another special host for today. It may be the first time y'all ever come across her, but I am more than happy to present our field marketing manager, Melissa Baker. Yeah. Doing Make me sound Melissa. so... So important and special. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Yep, yep. So I will let the both of you go ahead and take care of the show. I do want to preface that any information that is disclosed today is just a word of advice. It is not legal counsel, but Kyle will definitely be answering a ton of questions for you all in the chat today. So without further ado, I'll let y'all get to the show. Awesome. All right. How are you doing, Kyle? How are you doing today? I'm doing really good. Doing really good. Really excited. Looks like we have a bunch of questions here. Um, yeah. You know, just excited to jump in and, and talk about a lot of different things. Fantastic. Well, I do know from our first episode, there were a lot of questions around copyright and how um, the BeatStars platform protects creators when they upload their music um, with the things that we already have built in. So I don't know if we want to get started there as people continue to join and and, and get into the chat. But, um, you know, what, what sets BeatStars apart when it comes to um, how we protect our users on the platform? Definitely. That's a really great question, Melissa. Um, thank you for that. I would just start off with saying that just the baseline is just understanding what a copyright is, right? So, for example, as soon as you create an idea in a fixed form, you have a copyright. Um, and in order to enforce that right, right, you have to have a registration. So we actually have two things that we do. The first thing is as soon as you put something on the platform, uh, what you're able to do essentially is create that posted timestamp, right? So, for example, say you want to post something on the platform today um, and, you know, a year from now, someone takes that beat, they use it. You can always then go to the platform, screenshot all your information to show like, hey, my, my music was up first. Um, so that's one cool thing about the platform, the BeatStars platform. The other cool thing is we have, uh, you know, a work, working partnership with a company called Cosign, right? So, what Cosign allows, and I've been talking about this for a while now, but what Cosign allows you to do is essentially go in and use, if you go to cosign.com forward slash BeatStars, it's a really, really simple way to just copyright your work, right? Because in order to enforce someone, if they take your work, if they sample it, if they buy a beat and then try to go and sell it, you know, and try to get it placed, if you have that copyright registration and it blows up, right, then you're able to, to jump out there 
use your copyright registration from, you know, cosign that you'll get. And then also use your timestamp from the BeatStars platform and say, hey, this is my work. This is how it's protected. Uh, and from that, you're able to, uh, you know, go in and, and protect yourself. So, Okay. That's huge. That is huge, especially with having that timestamp um, because it's already there. So, you know, not that we're we're giving out legal advice here, but if I'm new to the game and I'm trying to um, start my business, these are one of the aspects that you have to think about is how to show that your work is your work. Correct. Correct. And then also thinking about, too, like a lot of times, you know, and I, I deal with this a lot. A lot of times people take stuff, right, a lot like stuff that they that they like or whatever because they don't really know how to purchase it, right? Or they don't, they don't, not all the time it's not like that, right? Sometimes people just steal stuff, you know, because they want to steal it. But a lot of times people take stuff because they don't know how to purchase it or they don't know what to do to clear stuff, right? Like who has ever thought about here's, you know, how to clear a sample, right? Maybe we should write an article on that. Like here's how to clear a sample or here's how to clear a song. So what B Stars does is, you know, not only give you the timestamp and the partnership with Cosign, but it makes it super easy for someone that wants to come on and use your work to actually have a way to clear it properly, right? Because in a license, they, you know, whether you do like a non-exclusive or an exclusive, um, whatever you decide to do, they know like, hey, I can go to their B Stars page and get all the rights uh, and properly clear. It. Whereas a lot of times, people don't even really know where to start. So they just, you know, rip it or pull it from YouTube or take it from here. Uh, and, and it causes, you know, a lot of friction as it relates to just copyright, you know, registrations and things like that. That makes sense. And when that comes up, so um, we did get a question in early on, you know, if, if a user is using distributor, then can they apply YouTube content ID to their beats? Yeah, so... That's a good question. So you have two scenarios there. So first you have the scenario where someone purchases the non-exclusive, right? And say, for example, well, it's really three scenarios, right? The first scenario is, okay, now I have that copyright registration. So what's the next thing that I can do to protect my work, right? Um, because that's what this is about, protecting your music. What is the next thing I can do to protect my work? So you have YouTube content ID, right? So for example, if you upload a beat, then you go and distribute it with content ID. So now, once you upload that, if anyone comes and they, they try to use that beat on YouTube, you're going to get a notification, and then you're going to be able to claim that work because you own that copyright. That's the first piece if you're just a producer. And we talk about this a lot. And the second piece is if someone then comes and purchases a beat, right? Say, for example, they come onto your store, and like, hey, you know, I really like this beat from Levi Beats or – um, Tiger Backwood or Bufo and they say hey I really like this beat and I want to purchase it if they purchase it non-exclusively you already have that content ID on there now you're able to claim the content ID piece because they have only non-exclusively licensed it right um, and when you do a non-exclusive license typically you're not able to claim content ID and the third scenario is for example if you go in and you purchase a beat uh, exclusively, right, as a, say someone comes, you know, to, to someone's store and purchase a beat exclusively, then at that point, that person purchasing the beat, uh, once they wrap over it or do whatever they want to do to it, they can then go in and use um, content ID on it because they have those exclusive rights um, and they can they can claim all that money. So it's really, it's really three things. You're thinking about first steps, how can I, as the producer, use content ID to protect myself the second thing is, how does a person, you know, that's purchasing it non-exclusively, they don't have the rights to use content ID. And the third thing is, if they purchase it exclusively, then they can use content ID to collect all that YouTube. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, I know it can, can sometimes be a little, feel over daunting, you know, but um, it helps when it's simplified like that. And, and again, going back to the, the platform and, and what's built in there to protect users, especially when it comes to IDs across different um, 
areas that we're sharing throughout social media and especially YouTube. So thank you for that one. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to switch over. We have another question that came in. Uh, why do you think placements like NHL look for non-published work and how can you keep um, yourself protected when dealing with opportunities like that? That's a really, really great question. Why do sync placements like the NHL look for non-published work? And how can you keep yourself protected with building opportunities like that? Um, so one thing I would say is, just a caveat, a lot of times people are looking for published work, right? And the reason why is published work typically has all of the writers listed, you know? So for example, say um, Tiger Batwood, you had a song or a beat or something that I really like. Say, for example, you was a part of a, a big song. Um, if I'm coming and I'm looking to put it in the NHL, I want to make sure that I know every party on the master side, that's what the, you know, the, the, the sound recording, and every party on the publishing side so that I can properly clear it. Uh, so that's the first thing. It's always good to have your, and this goes to like publishing, right? You always want to make sure if, you, if you're part of you know, B-Stars Publishing or any other publishing, you have those songs registered so that if someone's coming to do a sync, they know who to contact because that's half the battle. If they don't know who to contact, you could potentially lose that sync. Um, the second thing is when you're thinking about how do you protect yourself when dealing with opportunities like that, really two ways. The key things when you're thinking about sync is always remember they have to clear the master and the publishing side, right? So, for example, um, you all probably talk about this with, with Greg and Mike in our next session about publishing, but when someone comes, say, for example, they want to put it in this NHL commercial, if in order to, if the fee, if they say, hey, I want to give you $1,000, okay, is this $1,000 clearing masters and publishing, or um, is it just clearing one side? Because if not, then it should really be $2,000 so that we're clearing both sides. The second thing that you want to also do is ask for what's called uh, a most favorite nations clause, MFN, right? And what this does is, say, for example, you get this placement, you just say, hey, I want MFN. What MFN does is it just makes sure that if they offer other producers or other writers um, on this track $500 or $1,000, you will at least get the best offer that the, you know, the person clearing this song for sync has put out there, right? So always think about that, right? You want to make sure they're clearing both sides, the masters, and they're clearing the, the publishing. You want to make sure you get most favorite nations, which means, hey, whatever you're offering everybody else, the best thing that you're offering, I want that too. And the third thing that you want to do, and this you all already know this, but never sync anything exclusive. Like syncing is non-exclusive, right? So it's just like, I'm not going to sync this exclusively. Um, I'm only syncing this not exclusively because you will still be able to sell it. And then you will also be able to sync it in other places. And that'll just um, add value to your catalog. So I'll, I'll call those things up. Okay. Okay. And then I know we have a lot coming in here. So I'm going to try to catch them real quick. But we had um, a, uh, another question come in. If I have, if I have 1,000 in my publishing, am I going to keep all of it? when I cash out? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I would say for that one, because I don't want to give you the wrong answer, <laughs> yeah. but I would say it depends on your deal, right? So depending if you just signed up on the platform or if you had an, I don't know what you, the specifics of your deal, but if it's in your account, what I would do is just reach out to support and just ask that and say, hey, you know, I have this, this amount of money and I'm not sure if you... You should, I'm assuming you're signed to B-Stars, but hey, I have this amount of money in my score. When I hit withdraw, how much of this will go directly to me, right? So it's a lot of different you know, factors in that, but I would just reach out to support at bstars.com. We have the, the, the best support team in the world, so they'll hit you back pretty quick. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. And we absolutely do. We got to chat with Lee and Jamil last week, so this is great. Um, another question that's just come in is about, um, yeah, Song Trust Exchange. The internet is already on it. So, be, um, sorry, should we still get a Song Trust and Sound Exchange account 
or does BeatStars platform take care of everything that those services would do? That's a really, really great question, right? And I, I list this as something I want to highlight. We're hitting everything, copyrights, publishing, sound exchange. Um, so let's talk about that. So for example, BeatStars Publishing is a publishing app. So when you get with BeatStars, registering your tracks around the world in partnership with Sony, and then we're collecting the publishing piece on the composition side um, and also the mechanical royalties, right? So you're good there, right? So you don't have to go register with SongTrust um, or any other publisher admin because we're doing that for you. So that's, that takes care of the first one. Uh, the second thing is sound exchange, right? So what is sound exchange? Um, sound exchange is, say, for example, I'm looking for people in the chat. Um, Matt Diamond, right? We he, he has a track, and track does really well. Label wants to pick it up. So Label picks up this track, and they're going to put it out on their new artist. Now, when a label sends over that agreement to clear it, there's three things that's going to happen typically, right? You're going to get an advance, whatever that should be. You're going to get points, which is typically 2 to 5% of whatever the master makes. And then you're going to get publishing. But when you think about the points, right, the 2 to 5% for that placement, those points are also going to get you sound exchange, right? And what sound exchange is, is royalties for every time this song is being played. Um, you know, say, for example, Sirius XM, right? Or if you have, like, internet radio. All of these royalties get paid uh, via sound exchange. So you need to set up a sound exchange account um, in order to collect those royalties. And typically what happens is the label in the contract, they would essentially do what's called a letter of direction or AKA LOD and fill out a form that says when sound exchange pays out royalties uh, to the artist, right? You're a cut, right? So your equivalent of whatever you get um, from a point standpoint should be paid directly to you, right? And the cool thing about sound exchange royalties is that that are people, a lot of people don't know, you don't have to wait to recoup, meaning, oh, I don't have to wait, you know, for um, recording costs or an advance or anything like that um, in order to get sound exchange royalties, right? So the sound exchange royalties flow directly to you and they're really a good source of money, um, quick money, if you register it. Is there any advice, because I, I know there was a follow-up to that on, and I'm I'm assuming this is a sound exchange question, but on, on, on grabbing those um, royalties, you know, if you're owed yeah. something from sound exchange, um, yeah. how, what's the best route to claim that percentage? Yeah, so it's, this is a really great question and we deal with this all the time. The first, the first step to that is making sure that you have sound exchange language in your agreement. That's the very first step. Because a lot of times, producers, I see agreements from time to time where they'll just leave out sound exchange or they don't add the LOD, the sound exchange letter direction. So producers oftentimes don't even know that they're entitled to it. You are entitled to it. That's the first step. So you essentially need language in there. And again, this is not legal advice. This is just, we're just having a conversation. But you need language in your producer agreements that says, hey, producers shall be entitled to sound exchange royalties, right? Um, and that are always that should always be there. And typically, uh, when you think about these producer long form agreements, and we'll have some stuff come out this year that shows you all examples of what this stuff looks like in real time with comments. But there's like a, a schedule, right, or a attachment and it just is a paragraph about sound exchange. Um, and from there, you get a letter of direction for sound exchange that breaks it all down, your address, your email, uh, and then also how much you're owed, right, your percentage. And the label in that agreement, it says they will submit this to sound exchange, right? So oftentimes they don't. But if they don't and you get a sound exchange LOD, right, you just type in, and this is the easiest email, accounts at soundexchange.com. Right, you might get an email from someone like his name is like Matt Hirsch or someone like that, but it's accounts at soundexchange.com. 
And now once you submit that form, they'll help you get it processed, right? So I think the biggest thing, the, the biggest thing is um, if you have all of that in place, then that's how you do it. The flip side is, say, for example, you don't have any of that in place, but you know you're entitled to sound exchange royalties. Then typically what I always do is I look at the contract and I say, who's a lawyer on this, right? Typically the lawyer puts their name, email at the top of a contract. And you just reach out to them and say, hey, look, you know, I worked on this with this producer, um, but I didn't get paid for sound exchange, right? I didn't, did, did you all submit the sound exchange LOD or could you send me a copy? And from that, they should send you a copy. Um, and then also thinking about uh, sound exchange, sound exchange may say, hey, this is 100% claim. So you have to work with the artist lawyer and also uh, the label to unblock that. So then you can claim your percentage. So that's, it's really twofold. If you have a sound exchange, LOD, an agreement in place, just submit it to accounts at soundexchange.com. Uh, but if not, you got to work with the artist, lawyer, and the label to unblock it, then you should submit it. Amazing. Fantastic. Yeah, I think um, that one really hit home with a lot. So kind of going down into, you know, um, the continued talk about, uh, especially being social and online, Bufo has a, a, a really good question about chat GPT. Do you think there will soon be new ways to write and analyze contracts and highlight those potential risks in them just from your, your, um, you know, your point of view, your experience, what's coming down the line when it comes to, to things like AI writing songs, uh, that also still have producers and creators a part of them? Yeah, that's a really, really, really good, uh, really great question. And to be quite honest, right, I deal with a lot of contracts and that's one of the things I set up meetings with different companies, right? A lot of the time that I have now is on meetings and thinking about efficiency. And I just had a meeting with the company and they do that, right? They essentially allow you to create playbooks and based on the playbooks, they review contracts um, with using artificial intelligence, right? So everybody is thinking about artificial intelligence, chat, GPT. I just saw an article that Google is now getting into the race, which would, I want to say a free product that's going to allow their, their chat and their AI to be driven by all that search traffic, right? So everyone's going to have something like this. Uh, but I would say yes, right? That there's gonna be new ways, new services, um, excuse me, to analyze contracts, to copyright music, um, and to find songs that you all have put out there uh, that have potentially been used by someone else, right? So it's gonna be a lot to do artificial intelligence. On the flip side, there's gonna also be a lot of artificial intelligence um, out there that will duplicate some of you all's music that will um, really clog up a lot of stuff because people are going to be able to create at such a high rate, right? Mm -hmm. So there's good, there's bad. But one thing that I will, will say to you all, the most important thing that, that's going to be very, very key here we saw it even with NFTs, how they went up, and now people are like, is this phasing out? Um, we're going to see it with AI, right? Because we already kind of have AI, but it's not like, a, it's not a thing, right? Um, it's, it's becoming a thing. But the most important thing in this period is going to be ownership. Because no matter what software comes out, no matter what search engine comes out, if you have ownership, <laughs> right, you're, you're still going to have control, right? So back to our earlier conversation. If you have uh, ownership of your music with a registration, no matter what the AI does, you can always use it to facilitate that, to collect and to claim on that. And also, if you have ownership, you'll also be able to use that artificial intelligence um, to do certain contracts um, in your favor to, to highlight potential risks. So I, I did want to highlight that too. So it always comes back to what you just started with. From the very beginning. Always comes back to ownership, copyright ownership, um, trademark ownership, right? Owning your name. Like all you all have great names. Everybody in here has really great names, but it's like 
I would love to uh, poll the chat to see how many people in here have a trademark. Uh, because again, uh, everything is going to come back to ownership. Whoever has ownership and control uh, will dominate. You know this this new terrain that's that's going to be Chat GPT and, and all all other forms of technology. That's yeah. I'm going to need to to get my mom to let me have trademark on my name because I don't have as cool as a name, but now I want to kind of trademark it. Um, but uh, <laughs> she said I gave it to you for your birthday. So that's a whole other joke. But um, when it comes to like that chat um, uh, or AI in general, not just calling them out, but just AI in general, even if they're in a, again, sorry to put you on the, uh, on the spot with this one, but even if there's just a little difference in somebody's song that the artificial intelligence created, there's still something there as long as you're owning the basis of it, right? Like we can still have that conversation when we look at other songs that have come out throughout history where one note was just a little bit different off of this one. Um, and we tried to make the song different. You know, first comes to mind is Vanilla Ice and Ice Ice Baby and and all that that came through there. Do not call me out for saying Ice Ice Baby. But, you, you know, there's always that conversation with the tone just a little bit different. I slowed down this note. Does that still um, will that still continue on now that we're dealing with more computer and artificial intelligence to create? Yeah. So that's that's really an amazing question. And it it really unlocks a, a lot of different things. So the first thing is, if you have that copyright, well, let's start with your, your question, right? So what's gonna have to happen is, and if any of you all that play instruments really, 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 well, most of you all do, all of you all do, but if you all are looking for some something to make money off of to also further enhance your craft, musicologists are gonna make a lot of money because there's going to always be a need now with all this creation uh, to have someone that can not only listen to the music, but that can look at and look at the notes because if no, notes are inverted or whatever it is. They're just going to compare notes and the notes will tell if, if it's a copy. So that's the, that's the first thing. But the second thing, and it goes back to our earlier conversation, if there is a copy, right, if you don't have that copyright registration, uh, you can't file a suit, so that's something to to always keep in keep in your mind. And then the other thing to keep in your mind, which is really really cool, is the copyright office has now really made two bold things, right? So they've allowed there to be like a small claims court. So there may be some cases where it's not you know over twenty thousand. It may be a case of five ten thousand, but now you all have the right to use the copy copyright. Uh, small claims court, right, to file claims from, from your laptop, right, or against people, you know, self-directed claims when you feel like there's some infringement, right? You have to have that registration. And also, the Copyright Office has said that if the song is 100% created by artificial intelligence, then it cannot be copyrighted. So there, that's another protection for creators or someone that just may use a software or something to rip off all of your beats on your page, uh, there has to be some human intervention in those beats for it to be, you know, qualified for, for copyright. So just wanted to call that out too. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. And then while we're just on kind of copyright or trademarks, um, is it equally important to make sure that you also trademark your producer name yes trademarks trust me when i tell you trademarks are like so important especially for you all right because like what do you go by like you go by your name your tag this thing that you created that it's so amazing to me how many producers we have and it's very rare to see two producers with the same name so it's like some either someone's using like a, a name generator <laughs> a randomized name generator or like, you know, you all are just extremely dope. So I was just talking to a producer about this this morning, right? And I won't say his name, but he was saying, yeah, it's this artist and they're using my name. And like, what do I need to do? How do I go about protecting myself? So the first thing that you want to do is, and it doesn't matter what country you are in, 
Um, when you start making that money and doing what you're doing, you get your name trademark because what that will do for you is, say, for example, you create your name, Kyle the Producer. And mm -hmm. as you're taking off, there's going to be other people that use your name, these AI bots. They're going to use your name to try to sell what they're doing, right? So if you have, say, for example, the copyright route may not work for you to knock them down. But if you have a trademark and you have ownership in your name, then you can turn around and use that, protect yourself um, from people using it. And also, one thing that I'm learning about trademarks, a lot of times it's not even about protection from a standpoint of I don't want anyone using my name. But what you want to do is you just want to maintain that brand quality, right? So, you know, if, for example, Bufo, you create all of this great music um, and you have your name attached to it, you just want to make sure that someone can come up with a similar name and then put out music that's not on the quality that you're making because there's going to be confusion between your customer base, right, all the artists that want to work with you, and then all the people that may be going to this other person that could be, be potentially hurting your brand, right? So it's really important from a brand standpoint, first, to just make sure you have a trademark. A lot of brands have trademarks. They're very important to how you identify yourself in intellectual property. But then you also want to make sure you have that trademark um, so that you're able to just make sure that there's no confusion with other people and there's no harm to your brand if someone was to use your name and put out something that's not a quality that that's really associated with who you are. Gotcha. That makes sense. So I can't get internet to change my name to Kyle Brown DJ right now? No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't you can't. And that's a, that's a that's another uh, another thing too that is important, right? That I'll highlight is when you think about trademarks. Uh, one of the things that you're thinking about when you're thinking about trademarks and brand names is in the United States, trademarks are based on first use. So, for example, if you put your name out there first, uh, then at that point, right. That's that, right? You, no matter if someone registers or whatever, if you use your name first, you protect. Whereas in other countries around the world, it's about first to register. But even if you use your name first in a lot of places, um, and someone has registered something, you can always try to contest that so long as you use it first. So it's it's always important to just to get get a registration. And the easiest way to find someone to help you with that is just to go to Google and type in best trademark lawyers in blank. So if you're in the UK, if you're in Australia, if you're in New Zealand, if you're in Germany, um, if you're in the US, if you're in Alaska, just type in best trademark attorneys, and a list will pop up and call all of them and see how much they charge. That'll get you going. Great, great. My apologies, I'm not sure. Um, I think, uh, yeah, my name change uh, angered my internet. Uh, but <laughs> there's a question I want to get back to from what we were talking about earlier about sound exchange. However, we've had a few come through. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Internet, for putting that up. Um, what happens when it takes forever for the opposite party to add you to the sound exchange, etc.? cetera? Uh, what happens to the collective royalties when it takes over six months? So this is why it's important for you to have that producer agreement because typically there's a clause in there that says, and this is a great clause, a little clause, right? It says, if artists or company fails to add you to uh, sound exchange or fails to put you on that sound exchange, then they have to remit payment to you within 45 days of their receipt of it, right? So say for example, you get a placement and they never add you to sound exchange, but you're entitled to it. Um, once they receive that sound exchange, then you're able to, um, 45 days from that, uh, they got to pay you out. It is not subject to recoupment or anything like that. And this also goes to another point. It's also very important to have, um, you know, auditing and accounting language because 
in the event that sound you don't get it paid that sound exchange directly from sound exchange from an LOD. Uh, what you're able to then do is say, hey, look, I just want to audit you because I know you collect. I know this song went up on Sirius XM, and based on it going up and them collecting all the money from Sound Exchange, right? Uh, whatever your percentage is, if it's three percent, they're entitled to that. So that's that's something to think about. But I always just stay on and follow up about that. That's another thing, excuse me, that people forget about. And if you just don't get anywhere, you can audit them once a year, typically, and try to get those monies. Wow. Okay. Well, this kind of flows into that and then back to uh, a, a lot of the uh, trademark questions that we're receiving. But what is the process when somebody uh, uses, you know, your samples or melody, but they leave you out? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that goes back to the protection and the ID. But the, the split was with the major release. And how do you protect your intellectual property when you don't have a lot of financial resources to hire a lawyer? Yeah, so it's a couple of things you could do. Um, the first thing is you want to know who it is, right? So, for example, say artist A, you know, just push your song out. Do you hear it? you like, wait, that sounds like my melody or my loop. Okay, boom, you know it's artist A. So then what I always like to do is go to the credits, right? So go to the credits and, and look and see who's all involved with the track. You can do that by going to Spotify. Um, and you can see, oh, producer A, producer B. Oh, I worried with y'all. Y'all just cut me out. Okay. So then you go and you look and you see um, those producers and you reach out to them. You say, hey, this is my loop. I wasn't properly compensated. Um, please loop me in with the label. So that's the first thing that you can do. You just want to be looped in or you want to be looped in with the artist attorney. And at that point, um, you just want to say, hey, like this, my track, my piece of my music was here. I need to be compensated, right? And typically what they're going to try to do is tell you, oh, well, we cleared it through this producer. You need to take it up there because that's how agreements are structured. So that's that's the first part of how it would typically how it would typically happen. Now, if you have a publisher, right, because your composition is involved, I always reach out to your publisher, right, and say, hey, you know, my song was used improperly in this. Can you reach out to, um, say, for example, you with B Stars Publishing, because we deal with so many different labels, and, and, you know, sub labels and publishers and all these different people. You can reach out and say, hey, you know, my song was used improperly. Um, you know, what are like, what can we do about it, right? And typically we, we know what label and what person is there, what lawyers are involved. So we just reach out on your behalf and typically know what advance points publishing is should be allocated because we're seeing so much of it. And we can advise you on that. Um, if you're a pub member so that you get taken care of, you get cut in, you get the registry piece, you get the sound exchange um, part, which is separate from us, right? That's something on the master side. But I would always say it really starts with having a good publisher to help you sort sort this out um, if you don't have like a lawyer. And then if you don't have a lawyer or, or a publisher, it's really trying to reach out to those producers that have been credited. Um, or their managers, if, if they're listening to their Instagram bios, to just get clarity, to just get them to loop you with the label uh, or the artist. Right. Right. Thank you for that one. Um, yeah, so another question that came up is um, someone mentions coming across a website that says if your name or surname has become renowned or your goods and services are well known, um, you can trademark. But if it doesn't say if you can do this, wait, sorry, but it doesn't say if you can do that before, is it possible? So before you become renowned, is it possible for you to go ahead and set that that trademark for your goods or services with your name? Yeah, this is a beautiful question. Very, very well drafted. And um, that's, you can, right? So there's typically things, there's typically things, two, two classifications you're thinking about. The first one is if it's already out, 
it's like, oh, it's already out, it's already in use, it's in commerce. Uh, so you can you can do it based on that. Uh, the second way to do it is it's called intent to use, right? And that's a different way to file. But with intent to use, you're able to essentially say, hey, I haven't used uh, you know, producer A on the beat yet, but like I know I got a project in the works. And like I'm finna, my tag finna be all over this next big project, so I'm gonna file under intent to use. And when you file under intent to use, essentially what that allow you to do is preserve that mark. Um, that way you can still use it in the future. Um, you know, once it's once it's made commercially available. Okay, and then that just that stays with you. Right. Your intent to use travels with you from that point on. Right, right, and then I think. I could be wrong, I'm not a trademark expert, but you will essentially have to just update your um, gotcha. application to just show throughout, the pro and this is any any type of trademark. Um, there's also a process of like maintaining your portfolio. So you have to make sure that you're just always doing the refilings and showing that this is in commerce um, and that you're using it. Because what happens a lot of times in a lot of countries is if you have a mark that you just filed because you, you want to try to keep it, but you're not really using it, then someone that has a real vested interest in this mark uh, can always file a non-use, a cancellation for non-use. So it's important to, even if you do intend to use, or even if you file a mark that you're already using, to continue to use that mark, publish that mark. It's like promoting, right? Marketing yourself and your brand, because if you're not using it, you're just sitting on it, someone can always come and try to file a cancellation for them. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. So it keeps somebody from like going out and just getting every single name in the book that they can think of, right. but they really didn't have that intention. And yeah. Okay. Right, right. Um, the next question is um, how do you choose a trademark exactly? Is it just you creating your own and that's it? Or is it a pen and paper type of thing? Um, it's, it's really, it's an organic so take, um, this would be a really great question for A, right? Like, how did you come up with like B-Stars? Like, did you just, you know, I, I kind of already know the answer, but I'll let him tell that. But, you know, thinking about, thinking about how did you come up with something? So for example, it could be an idea you have. Um, uh, it could be, I made this really cool logo. Like, I, I really like how I designed this logo. Uh, it, it can really be any type of way. The important thing, though, is, and this is key, right? When you're picking that logo in the beginning or that tra or that name or whatever it is, you want to make sure you do a search because it would be terrible to build an entire brand off of a name and you didn't search and it's like, oh, somebody else is a the producer and they're producing music. And it's like, if you would have just did a search, you would have been able to tell that you need to pick so you can always go to the USPTO. Um, I want to say it's USPTO.com. Um, I don't know. It might be USPTO.gov, right? So that's another thing to call out. There are a lot of sites out there that are like seller sites where people just selling services. But always try to go to stuff that says .gov because it's an authentic government site ran by the government. So, you know, to pick a name, no matter where you're at, you want to find... The, the place where you can search that name uh, because you want a mark that you can file that's unique, that's identifiable to what you do um, so that you can, you know, that you can protect it and use it. And the, the other thing I would call out too, and this may be going a little bit too deep, but because all of the country, a lot of countries are really connected, right? So when the, all of these laws were drafted, you all know this, a lot of countries came together and it was like, hey, you know, like if you file this trademark in the U.S., then you're protected in the U.K. If I, okay, well, if people file in the U.K., then they should be protected in the U.S., right? So there's a lot of collaboration with countries, and there's this thing called Madrid, the Madrid Protocol, right? And essentially, it is the way that you go in and you have this one unique mark and you file it in all these different countries with one thing right, on, on one application. But in order to do that, you need to have something that's unique, 
that someone else doesn't have. Um, and if you think about that early on, that's something you can do. And it's a lot cheaper than having to go country by country to do violence. Um, you know, so I would just, just also think about that too. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, we did have a question on a producer coming up. Should they be creating an LLC or another small business type when they've started an online beat store through beat stars or, or otherwise? Always. We talk Always. about we talk about this with protect your art. But learning and setting up a business infrastructure early on is very important, right? even if you don't know what you're doing, right? And I know people say, what? Why would I set it up if I don't know what I'm doing? But you want to get into the habit of thinking about business with entities. And um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I know we have a bunch of, bunch of questions. But it's so important to give yourself a level of protection. So if you have an LLC and you get sued for, hey, you use this 808 or this sample, or whatever it may be, without my permission or something that you weren't expecting, right? Then what that LLC does, it protects your personal assets. So it puts you in a position to where only that LLC can be sued, right? Your house can't be sued, your car can't be sued. Um, you, they won't take your clothes, you know, you might have a pair of uh, Louis Vuitton Air Force Ones that you just bought because you got that big placement. You won't. Be, they won't be able to take all that, right? But if you don't have an LLC or a corporation or whatever it is, and you just have doing everything personally, then all of these assets are at stake, right? And the caveat is you have to really use the LLC for business, meaning having all the money go to an LLC, an LLC account, tax files, all of that, right? Which is really new ones. But the, the simple answer to that is yes, as early as you can, start setting, start getting in the mindset, setting up, you know, LLCs. Um, to protect yourself, to protect your music, and to also um, own your music, right? Because think about it. QC just sold um, well, for $320 million, right? I want to say 270 or 250 of it was cash, and the rest of it was they got shares in uh, another company that acquired them, right? So it's important to think about uh, – setting up an LLC and also how in the event that you sell your catalog or sell your company, the impact that's going to have on you from a tax standpoint um, and from an ownership transfer, uh, a transfer of ownership standpoint. And then also thinking about, you know, from an LLC standpoint, is it just going to be, that's one of the cool things about an LLC. It can be single, it can be single member, right? So for example, Depending on what state you are, it's a little bit new, more nuanced. But you can set up an LLC and it just be you, right? Um, you know, so it's a lot of advantages of, of, of doing that and, and just giving yourself a layer of protection for not a lot of money. And with that intent, still. With right. That intent. Gotcha. And um, so, uh, we did have a question about names. So, uh, is what if your producer name is your actual government name? Um, that's a great question. It can be done, right? You have people, you know, like Kevin Hart. For the, I think that's his full name. Yeah. But so. The cool thing about the cool thing about names and trademarks is when you're filing a trademark, you're gonna file that trademark based on classes, right? So, for example, you may file a trademark in class nine um, or cl class 35 or class 41, or class 42. Um, but there are going to be different classes. So whatever your name is, right, uh, say, for example, you know, Melissa Baker, right, you file that trademark and you're going to file your trademark based on classes. So there may, some, there may be somebody with the exact same name as you, uh, but their trademark classes may be really around um, you know, take brands that are like Tom Brown, for example, right? Mm -hmm. it, may, they're, they're, it may really just be around clothing. That's, a, that's, that's his own class. But then you may have a Tom Brown that's really someone that makes music and that raps, right? right. Or, or perform, you know, plays an instrument. So you can file using your, your government name, but mm -hmm. 
but it's really going to be determined by the classes that you use when you're filing on trade funds. Gotcha. Gotcha. So back to the, the timing of who, who was there first. All right. Um, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of them. Um, so another question came in for trademarks. If you um, have multiple trademarks, do you need to register each one separately? That's a great question. It, you do, because you may have your name, right, for example, producer A, right? But then producer A may have a logo, right? Producer A may have his name and a logo that's like, oh, dang, this is my, this is what I'm using for like my, um, and I see a lot of you all in this chat have it, right? This is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm using for, um, you know, just my thumbnail on Instagram or whatever. Right, but they all may serve a purpose, so you do need to register them separately. Whereas with copyrights, you can get up to 10 copyrights on one registration. So, on one registration, you can register 10 songs. So, that's the nuance between copyrights and trademarks. But trademarks, you do need to register, register them separately. Um, and if it's, if it's different, you know, you, you do. If it's different, right? Okay. Um, and then we had a question on interpolations and samples. Uh, do you have any insight or advice on how to clear interpolations and samples when it comes to music use? So it's two things you're going to think about here when you think about protecting your music. It's so difficult because I would say 75 to 80 percent of everything is a sample, especially when thinking about hip hop. It's all based on mashing up a bunch of different stuff because it's so nostalgic, right? And that's why it's boring, boring. And there's still a lot of culture uh, that's just coming along for the ride that was created really, really early on in the 70s and, and be before that. So two things you're thinking about. On the, on the marketplace side, it's important to clear samples because you just want to make sure when someone purchases something, they're getting something that they can use. And in order to clear a sample, typically what you have to do is if you want to clear a James Brown song, right? You just look up, okay, who's the publisher for James Brown, right? And then based on that, you just reach out to them, right? So they should be able to help you clear that sample. Now, it may not be at a price that you like. That's the right way to do it, right? Just looking up, you can go to songview.com uh, or BMI or ASCAP and just look, or the MLC.com and just look up who's the writers or whatever, and reach out to one of them. And that's how you clear sound. Um, and and that'll, that'll tell you, you know, what you need to pay, what percentages, you'll have an agreement, all of that. Now, the other piece of this is when you're thinking about from a placement standpoint, right? Say, for example, this record was just placed because someone heard it in the studio and they want it. It's easier to do it with placements because there's a section in the agreement that talks about approved samples. Uh, and what approved samples are, are samples that are approved by the label. Then once the label approves that sample, they'll take on the, the task of clearing, right? And what they'll do is they'll reach out, clear it, and then say, for example, James Brown wants 20% of the record. Well, if it's one artist, one producer, they'll split it pro rata. So they'll say, okay, James Brown, you get 20%, and each producer out of their 50% will just give James. 10 each, right? So it'll be artist 40, producer 40, James 20, right? So it's, it's a lot easier on the placement side if you disclose that uh, to the label because they'll help you clear it. Now, if you don't disclose it, uh, what it'll end up being is artist 50, <laughs> you 30, and James, and James 20. <laughs> so, James come back from the grave. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <laughs> so again, it, it it is the language. It is the the needing to make sure that the language is set. Right. It's needing to make sure you're you're time stamping, not only your your name and and your trademark, but your music as well. Like we can do with the with the Beat Starts platform when creators upload. Um, but it really does come down to 
making sure that you can put yourself in the place that you were there first. Is that is that right? That's correct. And the reason why, and this goes, everything is full circle. The reason why you're having to clear that James Brown sample, right, on the master and the publishing side is because someone owns those copyrights, right? And that's the value of having a copyright because it requires people to come to you to license and clear that so that they can use it, right? So not only does it protect you up front, but from a protection standpoint, say, hey, don't steal my stuff. But later in your career, when people find, you know, stumble upon your stuff, when they're crate digging or going through the, the internet, um, having that copyright just allows you to get more money because you can get clearances. Fantastic. And that's, and that is it. That's making sure that you get your worth for the product that you created and are putting out into the world. Right. No matter what. Yeah. Great. Well, I know we're down to our last five minutes, but this has been a wealth of information. Um, let's see here. I'm just checking the chat to see if we have one other burning question in here before we wrap. Um, thank you, Kyle, also for sharing your handle today. Uh, yeah. I know you have a lot of, of, of work and education. Um, if people wanted to find you elsewhere, can they can they look you up by your handle? They definitely can. So at Attorney Kyle, Instagram and Twitter, and just just DM me. Um, you know, and just if you have more questions and stuff like that, we always chat. I check them periodically, so more than happy to to keep this going. It's amazing. When it comes to attorneys, you are definitely the G-O-A-T. That's what I have to say about that. But yeah, it. thank you so much for today. I know you dropped a lot of knowledge bomb. Um, and a lot of thank yous came through the chat as you were answering those. I know you didn't get to see them all because you were you were letting us know, but uh, we even had Tiger Backwood go off and, and do his trademark while he was still listening. So you answered his question. He went and did it while he was listening. So thank you for that. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I really appreciate you. Um, you've been a, such a great you know host and like moderator of this. So just thank you so much for doing that. This is like probably one of the, the best ones I've ever done. And thank you, Anjanet, for, for also helping too and, and keeping us together. But the last thing I'll just say on my end, too, is like I always say this, is that, you know, your intellectual property is no different than like real estate, right? So when you think about real estate, there may be somebody with a thousand pieces of property that we probably all sitting in, right, or close to, um, and they may be making a thousand dollars a month from each property, right? So that's a million dollars. But when you all build this catalog, um, you have an opportunity to do the same thing without the overhead of maintenance of this. So you can make the same amount of money more. And then the other cool part of what you can do is typically there's a 15 to 20 times multiple place on the value of your catalog. So if your catalog is making $10 million a year, that's how you see people selling it for 200 million because catalog is value really, really high, right? So all of these things are, are important when you think about having an entity with an LLC, having a copyright, having a trademark, thinking about sound exchange, producer royalties, AI, syncs, placements, all of these things go into that catalog bucket of ownership, uh, and then you're able to leverage it. So just wanted to call that out and, and just say, hey, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for calling that out because it has been very interesting as we're seeing a lot of artists move to selling like their catalog. I think right. Justin Bieber just was the most recent with that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, thank you, Kyle. Um, and Jeanette, thank you as well. And um, thank you to everybody who joined and had questions for us today. Uh, we have our next series. I know we had some publishing questions in there, but we had some really good trademark ones and you were going with it. Um, so the next and, and final series with uh, how to how to get paid on Beast, BeatStar, excuse me, is next Wednesday, February 22nd. Um, we'll be chatting uh, publishing and, and with our music team. So, uh, Greg Mateo and Mike Trampy, but we hope you guys will join us. Keep an eye out for all of the information coming from that. If there is anything that you wanted to rehear, don't forget you can listen to Kyle's episode um, as soon as we wrap.
here on Twitch or on our YouTube live stream as well. So thank you, Kyle. I know you're a busy, busy man, but I appreciate you dropping in to, to really help us out over here. Awesome. Thank you so much and enjoyed it. And feel free to reach out if anyone has any more questions. At Attorney Kyle. There we go. All right, fam. All right.